Good morning, everyone. I invite you at this time to stand up and greet your church family. Kids are welcome to go back to class. There will not be announcements this morning. So check out the screen. Make sure you check out your bulletins. So this year we're going to start things off in a new way, and we're going to try to take our next step forward in the way that we do things. And instead of doing verbal announcements, we're going to be including them in the bulletin. We're going to be putting them up on screen. So we want to encourage people when we talk to them to let them know the door opens at 1050. And they can come in and see the announcements at 1050, as well as be able to check them online and that they really want to get a bulletin. Because instead of announcements and greeting, we're going to be opening with scripture before we go into worship. Our first reading for today is from Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 6. It says this, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar, and your daughters are carried on the hip. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth on the seas will be brought to you. To you, the riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Ephah. And all from Sheba will come, bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. Your light has come. God's glory is shining through your darkness. Now, if you are able, rise and shine to honor God with the breath he has given you this morning. Let us worship the Almighty. I invite you at this time to have a seat if you'd like. So, if you've been journeying with us through the Advent season and we're here during our Christmas celebration, then you probably remember that the concept of light versus darkness occurs often in Scripture. We know there is a perfect and good reason for that. One reason is to help us understand the difference between the Creator, Yahweh Elohim, and us. It also helps us understand, maybe more importantly, the difference between the world and Him. While we're trying to understand the difference, we have to remember that the world is under the influence of sin. We have to remember that it is cursed. We have to remember, while we are on this journey together, that we are surrounded by corruption, evil, and wickedness. An epiphany can be understood as an aha moment. That's often how it's used when we say that we've had an epiphany. We might say a light bulb turned on in our heads as if a new connection has been made that allows the electricity to flow through in order to light up that bulb. The way that we arrive at new understandings. And scripture plainly tells us that we have that we will have trouble as we journey through this sin-filled world. But it tells us as well that the light of the Savior is there to be our encouragement. Our Savior, the Savior, Yeshua, tells us to take heart because he has overcome the world, the world in which we will have trouble. The season of Epiphany, as recognized in the traditional church, begun in the 4th century in the Eastern Church. And the way that they used to celebrate it and observe it was focusing on the arrival, the manifestation of Jesus into the world, and then they also would focus on his baptism as part of that. The season of Epiphany is supposed to mark the end of the Christmas season. And actually, the first day is supposed to be the end of Christmas after the 12 days of Christmas, which I believe is January 6th on our calendar is how that ends up. Now, there are other things that ended up being a part of the season of Epiphany, including the Feast of the Magi. That's something that was added by the Western Church in the 5th century. All of that kind of 
distracts a little bit when you start talking about the feast and observing, commemorating the time of the Magi visiting the visiting Jesus. But when you look at the way the Eastern Church used to do it in the fourth century, they were focusing on what Epiphany really means. Epiphany comes from the Greek word, I think it's Epiphaneo, or Epiphaneia, something like that. And what it means is it means manifestation or appearance. So when we open our eyes with that new understanding and, and realize that the way that we've been using Epiphany in the English language is not accurate, at least to the Greek, for how it is supposed to be understood, then we start to realize that the season of Advent was about preparing for the arrival. Now the season of the Epiphany is reflecting on the Savior that has manifested and that is here. This is a time of reflection, a time to continue to anticipate as we lead, as we continue forward following the lead of God, as we journey through the life of Christ and we reflect on that. So Christian, during this time, grab hold of your God. Grab hold of his word. Stay strong in spite of the temptations in this world. When you see the shiny things around you, the things that promise you relief or pleasure, know that it is a hollow promise. These promises may bring you a temporary feeling of relief or pleasure, but these don't last. These fake solutions only leave us hungrier. Think about what you are stealing from God and your community when you reach out for the fake solutions. Think about what you could be doing with the gift of life He has given you if you would stop living in darkness. And when we think about our anticipation and our hopeful waiting and then the reflection on the manifestation, these things have happened for you to give you a new opportunity. Our first scripture for today showed us that people would come to us if we are God's people. If we do not have people coming to us, then we need to spend some of that time in reflection and wonder, ask, am I shining the light well? Do I need to fix something? Is there something about me that is creating a stumbling block for others? Is there somewhere I may have misstepped that is leading others down the wrong path? That is encouraging people not to change or to be comfortable in not being okay? See, if we are being the light of the world, people will come to us. But only if we are being the light of the world that Jesus called us to be. He said, be perfect as I am, as your Father in heaven is perfect. He said, none of us are good, not even me. But this is the bar that we need to strive towards. If we are not showing that we are actively striving towards that bar, then what kind of light is being shined into the world? The biggest thing that stops people from changing is when they see people who profess Christ in their life saying the same. Showing up in going through the motions, not really changing. That doesn't demonstrate a real faith. It doesn't demonstrate that the light is really in us. I know that the people who will hear this and that the people here feel God speaking to you about certain things in your life. I know you feel Him calling you to leave those things behind. And I also know that God has given you a way out. But maybe you haven't had that light bulb moment yet. So let me put it to you like this. When I ask you to consider what could God be doing with your life or what are you taking from God and His mission, think about the good that this local church has done and is working to do for you and for the community. The meals, the supplies, the sense of community that we're trying to build, the ministry that we do on a weekly basis, the chairs we sit on, everything that makes us happen, the only reason this place exists is because of the partnership that God has made with the Christians he is called to serve. It started with a whisper and with a call 
But his people had to choose to obey that calling, to be a part of it, to be willing to shine the light. Most of the Christians who serve you here were once like the community that we seek to serve. All of us are in different places in our journey, but most of us have been there drowning in darkness and sin. Most of us have been there lost until we decided to turn from sin and walk towards the light. Some of us maybe ran, and in spite of how I look, I did run. Spiritually, of course. This body doesn't run. God put it on all of our hearts to be the hands and feet of Christ here in Mount Morris. To be members of the body. To each have a certain role. To faithfully and lovingly sacrifice and serve to keep this going. What could God do with your life if you surrendered it to him? If you really surrendered it to him? Paul was a man who lived in darkness. It's as true about him as it is for us. Just because the date is different doesn't mean the world is different. We often stumble around in darkness like he did, without realizing that we, in fact, are in darkness. Paul had people killed believing he was doing the right thing. At 35 years old, whether you would say that's only 35 years old, as I'm sure some people here would, or you're thinking, oh my gosh, he's old, I think it's fair to say that I'm roughly middle-aged. But at 35 years old, God has blessed me with enough life, insight, and wisdom to experience these new dots connecting. And I see that, regardless of the number of years each of us has been given, and regardless of how far we are in our Christian journeys, we each tend to fall into a new hallway of darkness. We can start walking in the light but there's shadows cast in the world. There's areas of darkness, and we find ourselves at certain points in our journeys taking a little bit of a, the wrong fork in the road, the wrong direction, and finding ourselves in a new area of darkness. Sometimes we happen to end up in an area of darkness because of what somebody else has done. This is why life is truly a journey. Because assuming you're truly, truly living the life God has given you, there's many destinations in that journey. I'm not talking about many final destinations. But I'm saying there's many places we can stop. Our destinations always bring you challenges along with new rewards. When we think about the weather that we live through, and we try to put it in a realistic, applicable way, everyone here drives right? Or at least has driven in their lifetime. Everyone here, by show of hands, has driven in snow. Heavy snow coming down where it's hard to see. Everyone here has driven in hard rain. Also cloudiness, fog, darkness. So we all understand that each of those circumstances bring a different set of challenges. They may be closely related, like visibility, may be closely related. However, the solution, the way to find light when it's getting dark, is different for each of those situations, right? What do you not do with your headlights and fog? Turn on, body. Turn on your high beams. What would you do in nighttime during a clear day, especially on a back road? Turn on your, Turn on your high beams. Two different scenarios calling for two different solutions that are similar. The thing is that our destinations, the best destinations, the places we're trying to get through when we get through the darkness, are all going to come with a cost. Driving a car comes with a cost, doesn't it? It comes with many costs. All of these challenges are opportunities for the devil to strike. They are opportunities for us to fail, to become lost, or to stumble. That's one way to look at it. 
But what if we chose a different way to understand it? That these challenges or tribulations are opportunities for God to have our focus. Opportunities for God to get the glory. How many times do we overcome a challenge and point to God in it? Versus saying, I did that. Opportunities not for us to fail, not for us to become lost or to stumble, but to succeed, overcome, find, and grow. If you don't go through these things and find your way through to God's way, then how can you talk about it later? How can you relate it to others later? We're probably going to make mistakes, maybe take some wrong turns, turns while we're in the darkness, find out that's a dead end. But no just means what, church? No means next opportunity. And oh, next opportunity. No doesn't have to be crushing. It can be promising. By understanding that it hasn't happened because it's not the right opportunity, look for the next one. And even though we may drown a little, we may get lost, we may worry because our phone doesn't have service and we can't check Google Maps to get us out of this problem, it's only a matter of time until God's revelation or that signal is going to come through and occur to get us out of it. Let's see what Paul records in his letter to the first century Christian church in Ephesus. Next Ephesians slide, please. Beginning with verse 1 in chapter 3. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, the prisoner of Christ Jesus. Can you be free and independent in this life? Scripture back in Joshua 24 tells you you have to serve one of two masters. There's other places where it talks about it too, including in the New Testament. You cannot serve God and money. You will either serve God or you will serve the devil. There is no neutral territory. And even though we are free from the chains of sin, we are still, as Christians, slaves to an extent. Or prisoners to an extent. Basically, choose your prison is one way you can think of it. Paul has surrendered himself to Jesus. Completely surrendered. When he says... He's the prisoner of Christ Jesus. He's not depressed about it. He's saying it with excitement. This is something he's proud of. He's proud to serve God. Why shouldn't we be? There's a lot of people, right, in this world who are proud to serve the devil. Proud to celebrate the wrong that they do. So why shouldn't we celebrate the good that we do? Instead of letting people use it as a negative against us. Verse 2. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. Grace given to him for us. Not for him. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation as I have already written briefly. A manifestation or appearance of the truth. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. The mystery of the Messiah was not revealed to previous generations. When we think about our salvation, we think about it as ours. God saved me. But did God save you for you? Bible tells us he died for us, but did he die for you and that's it? Did he give you grace for you and that's it? Or did he give you grace and salvation so that you will work to serve others and be his tool? The mystery began to be revealed about Jesus 
after his baptism, ministry, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. Because we, when we study the life of Jesus, we understand that the disciples who journeyed with him every day didn't understand a lot until after he resurrected. Yeshua began to reveal it when, his, when he began his ministry on earth, but the dots didn't connect. Next, verse 6. This mystery is that through the gospel the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. The mystery revealed to Paul is that all are equal heirs to eternal life, <coughs> salvation, and reconciliation. Because the gospel is a promise given to us through the Messiah. And this is one of the biggest reasons why it is so important to accept and trust the word of God. As it tells us that Jesus is the only way to heaven and eternal life. Let's read on and see more about God's work in Paul's life next. Verse 7, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this ministry, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. Do you see? God called Paul out of and away from his previously evil life, giving him grace even though he killed his people to serve for us. A lot of the work that Paul did was only because God worked through him. Maybe all of the work Paul did is only because of what God did to him and through him. A legacy that lasts to today. A legacy and a light that shines throughout the Christian world today. Paul is not the light of the world. He was a faithful servant to Jesus. He did what Jesus said and fully committed. Paul chose to follow that light. And by following that light, he reflects it reflected it into the world. Paul chose to submit to the power revealed to him and surrender to the gospel. And Paul reminds himself of the truth, a truth that contradicts a common lie told by modern Christianity that we're good, that we don't need to change, that God loves us just as we are in spite of our sin. He reminds himself of the truth, and he reminds us that he and we are less than the least of God's people. By remembering that it only happens to us, for others, because of God, we can guard against being prideful. We can guard against thinking that we're something special. God could use anybody. And yeah, maybe when we say it like that, it sounds kind of horrible. But it's really probably not all that horrible for some of us. Maybe some of us haven't been down that much darkness. Maybe some of us haven't been to rock bottom. But just because our journey has been different, our starting point was different, doesn't mean that we are more worthy or less unworthy of God's grace. It's still a critical part of our journey to guard against pride, remembering it doesn't matter where we started, and we don't need to compare those starting points. It'd be, it's ridiculous to do it. We have so many differences. To compare our starting points is completely idiotic. But we shouldn't forget that even though we are better than we used to be, it doesn't mean we're done. And if we forget that we're better than we used to be, it means forgetting that we were once lost. 
It means forgetting that we once needed God as desperately as the homeless person on the corner, as desperately as the addict, as desperately as the single parent. And when we forget that, it means that we forget who's responsible for changing us. It means that we're starting to think we're responsible for making those changes all by ourselves. And because we're stronger than somebody else, we can say no to something they can't. That makes us better than them. No, it doesn't. Just because they haven't found victory over their struggle doesn't make them less than you. But if you don't remember that, then it leads to pride. Thoughts, feelings, worries, and actions that interfere not just with our Christian life. And here's the thing. The thing that the Bible tells you doesn't just apply to when you show up to church on Sunday. It doesn't. Pride destroys your relationships outside of church. Even if you aren't following God, pride destroys your relationships. It stops you from being patient with others because their thorn is something that you think is ridiculous. It causes you not to be patient with the people who are a thorn in your side because they cause you the greatest irritation regardless of how many times you've talked to them about it. It makes you forget pride that you probably still have a thorn in your personality or your character that bothers someone else. And it lets you be blind to how you affect others. And we talk about lack of social awareness. Just completely ignore the way that you affect others. But you're upset at somebody else because they did something that bothered you. Without taking time to reflect, what am I doing to bother others? Because most people are cowards. Most people won't tell somebody that they bother them. They just they think that pretending like everything is fine is the way to deal with it. But you have a responsibility when God shows you something, truly shows you something from Him, to share it. A responsibility to the truth. Because without that truth, without people being willing to accept that responsibility of sharing the truth, we wouldn't have this today. Next, continuing with verse 10. His intent was that now, through the church, through the church, people, the people, the Christians, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. In Jesus and through faith in Jesus, we may, we get to approach God with freedom and confidence. All of this to say that God called one of the worst men to be one of the greatest preachers in history. All of this to remind us that we sinners have no right to sit in judgment, in the seat of judgment, to bash the men that God has called to preach today, or to bash the women that God has called to serve. All of this to remind us that they were not, are not, and will never be perfect on this side of heaven. But that does not affect the truth of God's word. We cannot avoid church citing the things that hurt in the past when there are plenty of people who, to put it bluntly, got over it and focused on God. If we're having our faith destroyed and our commitment to the church destroyed because of people, then our faith and our commitment was in the wrong thing to begin with. And we're missing the point. Solomon, in spite of his flaws and thorns, has been and is regarded by many around the world throughout history as the wisest human king of all time. This is true beyond those who accept and believe the Bible's supernatural claims. It is evidence when you've been blessed with your appearance of truth 
your epiphany, whenever you hear his name or his wisdom referenced. Solomon was the son of David, and the Proverbs given by God through him continue to serve as enduring wisdom to guide lives today beyond spiritual perspectives. If I remember correctly, I want to say it was Billy Graham, one of the greatest evangelists in history. I don't know much about him. I don't have really an opinion either way. I just know he was one of the most, one of the biggest names in history as a Christian evangelist. Said something about reading through the book of Proverbs on a regular basis. So you understand that with somebody like that who reads the same thing over and over and over, that's the way you absorb it. That's the way that you start to make decisions based on what you're absorbing. This psalm we're going to read today is attributed to Solomon as the author, but it concludes as if it is David's final prayer. It, it, conc it concludes as if it is David's final prayer. So with that in mind, let's read some of the verses and remember this prayer from David for his son and take notes of these verses today so that we can and should understand more about how we should pray as we wait with hopeful anticipation for the return of the king. Next. Verse 1. Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. May he judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. These first two verses can be prayed today like this. This is not exactly exact way to pray. Just an example to help you connect and put it into practice. God, bless the judges of this world with spirits of righteousness. Bless them with your justice and guide their decisions over this world according to your justice and righteousness. God, deliver those who suffer through the people that you have allowed to be in authority positions in this world. David asks God to specifically influence his son, the new king, as David nears the end of his life. Next. Verse 3. May the mountains bring prosperity to the people, the hills, the fruit of righteousness. May he defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. May he crush the oppressor. Whether we like or agree with those in authority in this world, we need to pray for them for the good of us all. We can pray these verses like this today. God, give us all that we need and bless us with prosperity from your land. Defend those who suffer and rescue your children. God, destroy and remove the wicked in the world and the devil behind them that seek to oppress us. <clears throat> While David may be referring to specific earthly figures who bring oppression, we understand from godly revelation that the oppressor of the world is really who? Who's the real oppressor of the world? Yes, Satan. Next. Verse 5, may he endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon, through all generations. May he be like rain falling on a mown field, like showers watering the earth. In his days, may the generous flourish and prosperity abound till the moon is no more. May the kings of Tarshish and of distant land shores bring tribute to him. May the kings of Sheba and Seba Present him gifts. Next, may all kings bow down to him and all nations serve him. For he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in his sight. We can pray today that God will give us enduring, godly leadership and representatives. David's words may be turning to prophecy as these words conclude. He is probably knowing his artistic inclinations, weaving in double meanings and hidden, mess hidden messages in this prayer. We can pray these verses today remembering that Jesus is the King who fulfills all of these qualities and will bring all of us salvation. Next. So remember... The mankind waited for millennia. Thousands of years is what millennia means. With hope, faith, and anticipation.
for God to fulfill His promise of a Messiah that would bring them salvation, reconciliation, and freedom. But just because they waited and they had that very long journey doesn't mean they didn't make wrong turns into darkness. It doesn't mean they always walked upright. So take this message of hope with you from the light of the world. That as long as the breath of life remains in your lungs, so does your potential. So does your purpose for why God put you here, why God has given you grace, why God has given you salvation, <clears throat> and why God whispers to you to change. There's a reason why. You don't have to wait and shouldn't wait until the number on a calendar changes or until the clock strikes a perfect time or perfect minute. As a matter of fact, don't wait for that. You can let go of the wicked life you know and embrace the life that God is calling you to with all of its potential now. Make a big, positive, godly change in your life today. Flush the alcohol. Dump and stomp the weed. Block the unhealthy sexual content from your life. Throw out one big thing in your life today and know that God will do big things in your life, even if you haven't seen it yet. Don't be scared to take that next big step in your journey now. If you need a support system, that's why we're here. That's why God called these people here, is to be that support system with you, to help you be strong as you change, not to tell you it's okay to stay unokay. That's not a word, but I just made it up. You're welcome. <laughs> it's not okay to stay stuck. And we're not here to tell you it's okay to stay stuck. We're here to be understanding and compassionate that we know it's not, you're not okay. And it's not okay to be, it is okay to not be okay. But we don't want you to stay that way because that is not okay. That's as clear as mud now, isn't it? <laughs> We see your potential. We believe in what God can do for you because he's done it for us. So take the chance that we will be loving and supportive of you making positive godly changes. Take the chance that what God says is actually true. That the old you is dead and gone and you are a new creation in him. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for showing us your light, for preserving your word, for motivating people like us throughout history to follow you, for motivating people like us to change, to be a better light for you, a better servant to your mission and your kingdom. Thank you for continuing to give us this breath in our life, for continuing to provide us the way to come together and connect with you. For giving us all of the things that we need. Even if we don't appreciate them all the time. Thank you for the things you bless us with. That give us comfort even though we take them for granted. We ask you today. You know each of our individual needs. To radically and powerfully give us strength, clarity and wisdom. To know what to do next. Make that decision and stick with it. Let us be brave enough to step up, to be honest about what we struggle with, to try to make those changes, to ask for help. Let us be compassionate enough when somebody asks us for help to be loving to them, to be a part of their solution, not a part of their stumbling block. Freeing the people and the resources here that you need and you want for your kingdom and to help us be the best support system and the best light that we can possibly be. No, wait. Don't let us be the brightest light. Let us be the best candle holder for that light that is you, Lord Jesus. Shine it through us and through the work that you do here through your people. Keep us safe as we go through this week. Show us the opportunities where we can speak life and love and change into the people around us and our circle of influence. In your holy and awesome name we pray. All God's people said, Amen. I invite you now at this time, if you're capable, to arise and shine 
or light on to God by using the breath in your lungs to praise Him. One last time.